Hello, everyone. I'm really glad you could join us. I'm excited about uh, Irit's uh, reading today. Um, Irit has a long history in the psychiatric survivors movement. Before moving to Vancouver, she edited the Canadian journal Phoenix Rising, the voice of the psychiatrists. By the way, that's uh, archived at psychiatrists.org. Uh, Co-founded and coordinated the Ontario Psychiatric Survivors Alliance and presented two anti-psychiatry radio shows on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation Canada's public broadcaster uh, called Analyzing Psychiatry and by Reason of Insanity. Um, I think it was 1994 you republished uh, her great book, Call Me Crazy Stories. 19, from, it, was, it was 1997. Oh, 1997. Call Me Crazy Stories from the Mad Movement. And um, I've known you for, I think, for a long time, maybe, what, 20 years? But I think, yeah. um, I mean, and it, I think it was through this book. Uh, I just love the book. I don't know who told me about it. And um, for a while, it's been out of print. And for a while, I bought every copy I could find, every used copy I could find. And I kind of uh, cornered the market. I, it's like I had, because I wanted to be able to give it to people. And, uh, and I, uh, but then I decided, oh, well, I'm not letting anybody else get by it. So I quit doing that. But it's, uh, it's worth it. I had been vid videoing these uh, presentations at NARPA and I got was tired and Yuri was, I think, after dinner or something. I went and she gave this amazing uh, reading of this essay that she wrote. And I've been regretting it ever since that I didn't record it. And then I had the blinding flash of the obvious PFO that we could do it this way. And now we are. I named this talk Open Season on Mental Patients, but I could just as well have called it Open Season on Humanity. No one is safe from psychi psychiatry's project of medicalizing and treating just about every variation of human emotion and behavior. Especially in danger, as always, are those viewed with suspicion and contempt by the powerful, including Indigenous people, Black, Brown, Asian, and other people of color, big, loud, young men of any race, immigrants, refugees, people with physical disabilities, women and sexual minorities, old people, millennials, teenagers, even small children. The particulars of psychiatric treatment the labeling, incarceration, solitary confinement, shackles, drugging, electroshock, and the less obvious violence inflicted on those leading silent, terrified lives under community treatment orders cause a staggering amount of damage to so many minds, bodies, and souls. Media of all kinds are always screaming at us about the mental health crisis. And there is, in fact, an ongoing crisis, but it's not what they imply. Unbearable conditions of poverty, discrimination, abuse, neglect, and all the other ills that plague our society are driving more and more people into states of alienation, despair, and insanity, which are then attributed to supposed medical conditions to be treated with drugs. Creating and maintaining an atmosphere of despair, anxiety, and panic drives clicks and draws readers and viewers, but that's not all it does. It also facilitates the marketing of various means of individual and collective social control, from drugging away your own troublesome emotions to having troublesome humans shut up, shut down, and put away. Psychiatry's witting and unwitting minions including police dealing with situations seen as being caused by mental illness, produce untold suffering through their oppression of some of our best, brightest, and most sensitive citizens, and people who are not citizens as well. In British Columbia, where I live, police have literally broken into people's homes, no warrant required, because some acquaintance has reported what they perceive as strange behavior. 
Not only physicians and family members, but friends, neighbors, and even random passersby can trigger legally sanctioned home invasions, which may end up in incarceration and forced drugging, simply on the grounds that a person is deemed incapable of appreciating her need for treatment. And way too many mental patients end up being killed by police. Predictably, the most common victims of such murders are poor, and many are Indigenous. I think of Chantelle Moore, a First Nations woman who was just 26 years old when police officers entered her home to conduct something called a wellness check in 2020 and ended up shooting her dead. And there have been many other murders. Wellness checks are just one example of the ferocious increase in psychiatry's power to inflict forced or coerced treatment in hospital and even in the community where it is administered by assertive community treatment or ACT teams under outpatient committal orders. British Columbia boasts Canada's most regressive mental health act. The criteria for involuntary admission include the stipulation that you acquire care, supervision, and control in or through a designated facility, either in order to prevent your substantial mental or physical deterioration or for your own protection or the protection of others. These criteria are so vague and all-encompassing that in essence anyone can be locked up for anything. And of course, once you've been made into a mental patient, any unusual behavior, however harmless, is way more likely to trigger psychiatric interventions. Extended leave is my province's ugly euphemism for outpatient committal. When you're on extended leave, you're technically free. Legally, however, you're still under hospital care. The state is, in essence, splitting persons. You're at large in the community, but at the same time, you're legally detained. You can't run away, you can't hide, you can't go underground. If you walk out of a designated facility without a doctor's permission, a warrant can be issued for your reincarceration, or as they put it, recall to hospital. In effect, extended leave transforms the entire province, notably including your own home, into a designated facility. And what if they're looking for you and you have no home? The cops are empowered to show up at one emergency shelter after another, demanding the list of names of people staying there. If it's winter and you're staying off the street so you don't freeze to death, they can track you down. When you're obliged to attend your ACT team, your schedule doesn't matter. They set an appointment and then they tell you about it and you either show up or risk being recalled to hospital. Extended leave has been compared to prison parole, but parole is finite, whereas extended leave can last a lifetime. All it takes is for one doctor to sign a new form each time the previous one expires. There's nothing else like this in our society. This status of a human being who is not physically confined, but who can be reincarcerated at any time on the word of a physician, and even if she's adhering to conditions. Police officers, often undercover, are essential to ACT teams. Each team also includes at least one mental health professional and sometimes a peer who provides personal support. But even when there is a peer, she is in a subordinate position and unlikely to be able to alter the intended outcome of an intervention. Friends who have been subjected to extended leave have been devastated by the intrusion into their homes of officials whose job it is to monitor their behavior and ensure treatment compliance. And even if you are compliant, the team may visit with no warning to check up on you or on the state of your home. A messy apartment can be used as evidence that you're in danger of deterioration. And as always, the threat is much worse if you are not white or not English speaking or not ordinary looking, etc. And then if you're not compliant, say if you're not showing up for team appointments or your blood tests show that you're not taking your drugs, the team is legally allowed to enter your home by force, grab you, pull your pants down and administer an intramuscular injection. 
As those of us who have had COVID vaccines know, there are injectable muscles in the human. But psychiatry prefers the gluteus maximus. It's more humiliating. I know of people who are afraid to spend time in their own homes because something like this might happen to them. And what about these drugs you can be made to take against your will? The drugs most commonly admit, administered by brute force are neuroleptics, also known as antipsychotics. Long-term use of these drugs can crush your dreams, your hopes, your desires, what you had thought was going to be your future. It can delete or diminish the self you knew. And virtually all neuroleptic use is long-term. What mental patient hasn't been told she has to take these drugs for the rest of her life? And let me remind you of some of the short and long-term physical effects of neuroleptics. Akathisia, dystonia, dyskinesia, tardive or otherwise, dizziness, dehydration, constipation, sexual dysfunction, blood vessel hemorrhage, osteoporosis, diabetes, heart, kidney, liver, pancreas, abdominal and other organ damage, neurological damage, seizures, obesity, Parkinsonism, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, look it up, decreased life expectancy, sudden death. As for cognitive effects, it's very common for these drugs to cause withdrawal psychosis when you go off them. And they also cause confusion, memory problems, problems with focus, concentration and thinking, anxiety, distress, paranoia, so-called. Yeah, let's talk about paranoia for a moment. The classic meme is of someone who mistakenly thinks they're being followed or surveilled but it should be recognized that mental patients often live under a terrifying level of actual surveillance. My friend Fred once said to me, as I get older, I realize I'm not paranoid. The nice kind nurse is trying to get information from me. After she finishes sympathetically listening, she goes into the nursing station and writes everything down. When I try to get out, it's all used against me. So why does Fred keep getting locked up? For one thing, like me, he has some unusual ways of looking at the world and doesn't always hide that. Also like me, he sometimes gets so angry about injustice that he behaves in ways that upset people. As a white mental patient, I have been persecuted a little bit, but Fred, who is indigenous, has been persecuted a lot, in his case for failing to conform to white norms. But what if normality is overrated? And what if bizarre behavior that causes discomfort or suffering to oneself or others is not as psychiatry claims, but never has been able to prove the result of a chemical imbalance in your brain? What if your perceived craziness is actually a natural response to the actual craziness of the world we live in? And what can we do for ourselves and each other if and when we're lucky enough to avoid or escape psychiatry? Support systems and coping mechanisms are vital to this discussion, and these can be of use not only to psychiatrized people, but also to those in danger of being psychiatrized, which is, of course, absolutely everyone. In my view, the number of so-called alternatives to psychiatry is infinite because people keep coming up with new ones. Among the many that have worked well for me are traditional Chinese medicine, aromatherapy, reflexology, various breathing techniques, Feldenkrais and other body awareness and integrated movement disciplines, physical activities such as yoga, tai chi, bicycling, swimming, dancing, singing, listening to or playing music, in general, being outdoors, even in the city, writing, drawing, any creative activity, and most importantly, human contact, and the choice of who to have that contact with and when and where to have that contact. Ah, choice. So essential to a livable life and so unavailable when you seek or are forced into professional help at a hospital. 
If you're a good girl, you sign yourself in, go straight to the ward, take your pills, and obey all the rules. But if, like me and so many others, you get hauled into the bin against your will and try to fight it, what you get is confinement in a tiny concrete cell with a steel toilet and sink apparatus in the corner that may or may not work, and a mattress that may or may not have a sheet on it. By the time you get there, you've been stripped of all your clothing and made to put on one of those humiliating hospital gowns open at the back. You have highly toxic drugs coursing through your veins, forcibly injected by a nurse while orderlies held you down. And then if you're even more like me and happen to have a paradoxical reaction to these drugs, they will make you a million times crazier than you already were when the cops hauled you in. Often you are shackled to the mattress by means of physical restraints, straps holding you down by the wrists and ankles. The lights, if they've been left on, are fluorescent and harsh. The door is locked. In the seclusion cell, no one can hear you scream, or at least no one's going to respond. You are left alone with your rage, terror, and desolation. The process of breaking your will has begun. Once you've been made compliant enough to be released into the general population, there will, if you're lucky, be physical and creative activities to punctuate the monotony of life on the ward, and these will be framed as therapy. But such activities, and all activities, are always so much more enjoyable when they're not framed as therapy. After all, the idea that the underlying problem is a medical one remains unproven. A nice experiment would be to offer a sampling of things known to help people feel better and let you pick whatever appeals. A trusted friend, family member, or advocate could be with you to provide kind, gentle guidance and advice. Mind you, when you're in a state, you might be unable to choose items from a menu, even with assistance, so it would be better to put a plan in place in advance before problems arise. But it can be hard even to envision common sense prevention strategies and solutions in an atmosphere of fear and a near universal belief in biomedical fixes for emotional, social and political problems. It would help a lot if everyone learned about extreme emotional states early on. In my ideal world, elementary school children would be taught to understand that bad things happen to everyone, that anyone might have a hard time coping, that some ways of coping look weird, and that difference can be greeted with curiosity, respect, and even appreciation, rather than fear or suspicion. However, here in the real world, we can at least put an emphasis on meeting basic needs, such as good nutrition, decent housing, enough money to live on, meaningful work, and adequate health care, none of which should ever be tied to mental health services. I'm pretty sure that if every person in Canada had unquestioned access to these essential human rights, the incidence of so-called mental illness would plummet. A common sense empathic approach can go a long way. I want to tell you briefly about VEEC, that's V-E-E-C, the Vancouver Emotional Emergency Centre, a little piece of history. Way back in 1974, a group of former mental patients and their allies founded VEEC, a safe space where people in extreme states could stay for a few days or weeks and be accompanied while they went through whatever they were going through. No drugs, no force, no medical personnel just people helping people in whatever way was wanted. Despite or because of its unprecedented success in keeping people out of hospital by helping them navigate emotional crisis, the center lost its funding after only two years. It was just too much of a threat to the psychiatric establishment. The late great activist Judy Chamberlain stayed there in the earliest days of her own activism and was inspired to write on our own patient controlled alternatives to the mental health system. By the time I moved to Vancouver in 1993, it was hard to find anyone who even remembered Veek, but I've never stopped thinking about it. The point of getting support from other psychiatrized people outside of the system is not just that they won't be alarmed by you or that you can learn from and be inspired by their experiences. It's also that the support 
you're not being treated or talked down to. The contact is genuine and natural rather than being bound by therapeutic imperatives. No one in this picture needs to be fixed. I can just about hear in the far distance the howls of people, not any of us here, I hope, protesting the idea that those with severe mental illness or in a state of florid psychosis do not urgently need suppression and drug treatment. Well, decades ago, Michael Cornwall, voice hearer, activist, and therapist, was working at a special ward in a California state hospital. I met Michael at a Toronto conference called Psychosis 2.0. I was stunned to hear him say, we didn't use medication or restraints. We knew we'd get punched, hit, kicked, physically assaulted, but other staff would come and we'd securely hold the person in a loving, gentle way. And almost always this would result in a real turning point in that person's process. Another speaker at that conference, voice hearer, researcher, author, and counselor, Eleanor Longdon said, I believe there is no greater honor no greater privilege than facilitating this process, than bearing witness and reaching out to voice hearers, than sharing the burden of suffering and holding the hope of recovery. These words made me think of my friend, mentor, and longtime lover, the late, great Chris Birchall. Chris was a superb journalist, a passionate socialist humanist, and a brilliant and effective women's and gay liberation activist. Before she died in 2007, she and I were planning to write a book together called Paid to Care about the problem with making a living from the provision of love and caring, which some practitioners claim to offer by way of therapy. Call me cynical, but I have to ask, when you're making money from it, can it really be genuine love and caring that you're providing? In general, people set high stock by professional expertise, but in truth, each of us is the expert on her own self. And it's not just psychiatrized people who can help each other. Anyone can get help from friends, relatives, and others, from almost any compassionate person whose perceptions have not been muddied by psychiatric, psychological, or social work training, or by the cop mentality that often develops in those who enter such professions, however good their original intentions. I very much doubt that anything learned from psychology textbooks compares to what an ordinary grandmother understands about life and has to offer by way of wisdom, kindness, and support. Our society includes more and more old people, retired people, people who can easily be made to feel useless. So many end up being made useless, shoved into so-called care homes, where they are often brutalized with restraints, tranquilizers, and sometimes, incredibly, electroshock. And where, lately, far too many have been dying alone and desperate as COVID tears through entire facilities. And yet, if such institutions didn't need to exist, because, say, we lived in a society in which people took care of each other and elders were honored. Imagine how much they might have to offer to others who are or are in danger of being in psychiatric or other trouble. And what about all the abused, neglected, or abandoned children and teenagers currently being labeled and made to take harmful drugs? Surely these youngsters should have opportunities to get support from those oldsters and vice versa, rather than every, everyone being expected to get professional help. I want to return briefly to the subject of ECT, electroshock, so-called electroconvulsive therapy. ECT is well known to cause permanent brain damage, which affects, with effects notably including permanent memory loss and severe cognitive deficits. Most members of the public believe that ECT went out of use decades ago, but in fact its use in, is very much on the rise. When I was young, shock was mainly used on people who were unresponsive to drug treatment and those diagnosed with clinical depression. Then, as now, many recipients of forced or coerced ECT were unruly women, and especially older women, and especially women of color. 
But of course, men, and especially marginalized or scary looking men, are often subjected to unwanted ECT as well. And now the scope of ECT is much broader and notably includes children. According to the National Institutes of Health in the United States, quote, the indications for electro electroconvulsive therapy in children and adolescents are similar to those in adults. Multiple published reports demonstrate the safety and efficacy of ECT in pediatric patients with a wide range of psychopathology. ECT has also been successfully used in youth with autism and other neurodevelopmental disabilities. However, resistance and stigma persist regarding the use of ECT in children and adolescents in both the professional and lay communities, creating barriers to pediatric ECT access. We argue that the use of ECT in children and adolescents is appropriate for specific clinical indications and urge removal of impediments to ECT access in this population. There is sometimes the appearance of informed consent being followed as required by law, but who would ever consent to electroshock or indeed to any psychiatric treatment or procedure if all of the risks were divulged? Over and over again, we are told that mental illness is like diabetes and that antipsychotic drugs are like insulin necessary for saving lives. But in fact, there are physical markers for diabetes and for every other real disease, but none for any mental illness, not to mention that antipsychotics actually cause diabetes. I know or know of way too many people who've had physical problems that were ignored or not found by medical professionals due to a prior psychiatric diagnosis. Years ago, Canadian artist and author Persimmon Blackbridge was diagnosed with depression when she was actually suffering from a physical order, disorder called hypercalcemia. But Persimmon had a psych history, so no one thought to look further. Shrinks decided she'd had a lifelong problem with bipolar two. I'm the world's least manic person, says Persimmon, but they had to make my previous non-depressed times fit into their diagnosis somehow. For 10 years, Persimmon took antidepressants. Meanwhile, her kidneys kept deteriorating. By the time she was finally correctly diagnosed, she'd become exhausted and dizzy. A doctor checking for diabetes happened also to check her kidney function and discovered the whole mess. Persimmon ended up losing a kidney completely unnecessarily. And now I'm going to tell you my own story about real versus fake disease. In the year 2000, I was diagnosed with cervical adenocarcinoma, an especially pernicious type of cancer. Had my tumor not been found in time, quite by chance, and had I not had emergency surgery to remove it, I would have died. I had been locked up several times during the previous two years after 18 years psychiatry free. And whenever I get locked up, I spend a long time afterwards just lying in bed feeling sorry for myself. So there I am, pretty much unable to think about anything except wishing I were dead. And then all of a sudden I find out I have cancer and instantly all I wanna do is survive. I've always thought this was such a hoot that the effects of being diagnosed with a fake disease, bipolar disorder, caused me to long for death. But being diagnosed with a real and potentially deadly disease made me fall in love with life. Since then, I've developed an increasingly keen sense of what's most important to me, helping others survive or avoid psychiatry and find better ways of living in the world. Award-winning journalist Rob Whitebond has written extensively about how well psychiatric treatment doesn't work. I urge you to check out his writing at robwhitebond.com. In an article published at alternet.org, Rob describes a Danish study which found that people who had visited a psych emergency room were 30 times as likely to kill themselves as those who are not were actually admitted to a psych hospital were almost 50 times as likely to kill themselves. The study quotes a psychiatrist who admits, 
quote, it is entirely plausible that the stigma and trauma inherent in psychiatric treatment, particularly when treatment is involuntary, might, in already vulnerable individuals, contribute to some suicide. Another of my favorite writers on psychiatry is UCLA professor, researcher, and author David Cohen. In his essay, It's the Coercion Stupid at Mad in America, Cohen writes, since the beginning of psychiatry, the only constant in psychiatric treatment has been coercion. Psychiatry's coercive function is what society most appreciates about it. Families and others can call upon police to restrain someone acting strangely and have that person taken by force to a place run by psychiatrists. Without the shock and awe of a coercive medical discipline, the flimsy theories and continually refuted hypotheses of physiological defects as causes of distress and misbehavior would actually have to account for what ails people, what makes them tick and how to help them overcome their problems. After decades of engaging in critical analysis of the psychiatric and other evidence, writes Cohen, I conclude that there has never been good evidence to support psychiatric theories. Psychiatry's top experts admit that they have found no biological marker markers for any mental disorders. Yet no one cares that 50 years of psychiatric research have failed to turn up a single scientific finding. Fortunately, amazing work is being done outside the system to promote better ways of dealing with extreme emotional states. This includes efforts supporting the implementation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD which prohibits forced psychiatry and upholds the equal rights of all people with real or perceived disabilities, including psychiatrized people. I urge you to check out the campaign to support CRPD's prohibition of commitment and forced treatment at absoluteprohibition.org, and also the Center for the Human Rights of Users in Psychiatry and the World Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry. Also promoting many good ideas are Mind Freedom International, the Wildflower Alliance, and in Canada, the Coalition Against Psychiatric Assault, Our Voice, Notre Voix, Madness Canada, Mad in Canada, Health Justice, Sea Spring, and the Mad Canada Shadow Report Group. And don't forget to ask Jim about Soteria Houses. I'm also aware of AFIA houses, which I should have mentioned, but didn't get there. AFIA house, rather, which is another wonderful non-medical thing in the States. I would also encourage you to check out some of the back issues of the Canadian national magazine, Phoenix Rising, The Voice of the Psychiatrized, which Jim has very kindly put up at psychiatrized.org. Phoenix Rising was founded in 1980 by Don Weitz and Carla McCaig. Don Weitz was a survivor of insulin subcoma shock. He was also the great pioneer of Canadian anti-psychiatry. Don was one of the angriest, kindest, most tireless and most generous activists I've ever met. And it wasn't just about psychiatry either. Don never stopped fighting against all the different kinds of injustice and discrimination on which Western civilization is based. We lost Don on September 1st. 2021. Carla McCaig, who died in 2015 and was supported by Dawn to the End, was an electroshock survivor, author, and for decades a ferocious advocate and mental health lawyer. Both have written powerfully on issues related to psychiatric force and fraud. You can read Dawn's book, Resistance Matters, an anti-psychiatry activist speaks out at maddenamerica.com. Phoenix Rising was published until 1990. It gave a voice to psychiatrized people who had never had their work published before, showcasing talents previously buried under the weight of shame and suffering. I had the enormous good fortune of being hired by Dawn to edit Phoenix for its final four years. That work revolutionized my life and helped me more than anything else in recovering from psychiatry.
The hopeless, hurt, lonely, angry mess that was me. All that seemed to remain of my self, once the shrinks had got through with it, was transformed into a feisty defender of psychiatric survivors' rights. When I look back at Phoenix Rising now, I am wowed by its beauty and power, and this is not because of my competence as an editor or the considerable skill of its designers. Rather, it's all about the contributors' brilliance and the magazine's uncompromising ethical stance. What I have longed for more than anything else ever since 1990 when it folded is that the Phoenix should rise again. And that is why I am so thrilled to tell you that this might actually happen thanks to the Don White's Legacy Project. December 10th, 2021 was Human Rights Day and would have been Don's 91st birthday. On that day, his children, my dear friend Lisa Whites, and her brother Mark led an inspiring online celebration of Don's life. One of the upshots of this event was a generous gift from a Canadian philanthropist to start something new in Don's name, in his memory. And one of our hopes is to resurrect Phoenix Rising as a downloadable, printable online magazine. I can't tell you how much, how much I look forward to editing Phoenix again, if that's what ends up happening. But I can tell you that Don Whites would have loved this idea. And buoyed up by the opportunity to do good things in Dawn's memory, I find myself daring to hope, maybe there will come a day when the entire disease model of strangeness and distress has been made obsolete. When the idea of mental illness has faded from memory because everyone knows that otherness and emotional intensity are not and never were medical issues. When the idea of mental illness has faded from memory because everyone knows that otherness and emotional intensity are not and never were medical issues and that diversity and difference are at the very heart of what makes humanity wonderful. Because despite all the horrors of the 21st century, human beings are amazing creatures. We have the ability to come together with open minds, open hearts and a will to make things better. And when we do, we can find the power that systems have taken away from us or that we never had in the first place. We can resurrect ancient ways and create beautiful new ways of dealing with problems of mind, soul and heart. I think maybe we can change the world. And at the very least, we can surely do a whole lot better than the mental health system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making me cry. Yeah. Oh, and, and love. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.